Okay, welcome brothers and sisters in the faith to another episode of the BQA, the Bible Questions and Answers. And our topic for today is about the book of Enoch. Should it be included in the biblical canon? Is it inspired by the Holy Spirit? These are the questions we're going to be looking into and attempting to answer in our program today. But before we go ahead and proceed, we ask everyone to please stand for our opening prayer. Everlasting Father, thank you so much. Gracious Abba. Because you are merciful and kind as always, you are faithful to your promises, and because of this, we remain with you, and you remain with us. Father, please continue to bless everything that we shall do as we open our eyes, open our minds and our hearts to you and to your teachings. Bless us, please, with wisdom that we can properly discern between what is true and what is false, mm -hmm. that we can make the proper choices in our life that will lead us closer to you. Our King Yahushua, may you please strengthen our faith, mm -hmm. bless us with more wisdom, be with us in our study today, mm -hmm. and may you cleanse our souls and our hearts. Mm -hmm. Father, we believe that you have listened to our prayers. Mm -hmm. We ask and beg everything in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahushua HaMashiach. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay, thank you, brothers and sisters, for attending our Bible study for today. We're going to be looking into the book of Ina. More and more people recently are looking into this book, studying it, and even endorsing it, making the claim it should be added to the biblical canon. Because if we look at our Bible today, at least the uh, modern, regular versions of the Bible, it doesn't have the book of Ina in it. We have the book of Isaiah, the book of Proverbs, the book of Psalms, so on and so forth. Of course, uh, there is no mention of the book of Enoch, which prompts many to ask, well, why should we not add the book of Enoch into the scriptures? Is it scriptural, God-breathed, or inspired? So this is what we're going to be examining and investigating today. Now, before we go ahead and look and answer the question, is the book of Enoch inspired? We need to first understand, well, which book of Enoch are you referring to? Because there are actually not one, not two, but three books of Enoch. There's first Enoch, second Enoch, and third Enoch. Now, the consensus among scholars is that the second book of Enoch, the third book of Enoch, is really not important. It's not, should not even be considered to be inspiration and should not be considered to be added to the canon of the Holy Scriptures. Because according to scholars, for example, from the Britannica, the second book of Enoch, is also called Slavonic Book of Enoch because the only existing or surviving material comes from a Slavonic translation of the Greek original. So this was the extant material that was found in the 7th century AD, but it may be a translation of an earlier work during the 1st century AD. So when it comes to second Enoch, when we look at the content, it sounds very, very strange. I mean, the first Enoch was strange. This is even more strange. And according to other scholars, the origins of second Enoch 
are unknown. So the earliest time it could have been crafted or put together was in the first century AD. For many people, it was probably put together from the second century AD to the 10th century AD. So it is a mystery concerning its origin. And concerning the third book of Enoch, according to scholars, the late Jewish apocalypse of Hebrew, probably compiled in the 6th or 7th century AD. Other scholars place it at the 10th century AD. Uh, third Enoch can hardly be, could hardly have been written later than the 10th century AD. So many scholars regard this as a compilation of many different works put together. And so what we see is a development in the tradition of the book of Enoch. So the book of Enoch, number one, it did not stop there. There were many who were attracted to it, put it together to construct second Enoch and third Enoch. So this tells us the whole Enoch series was probably not written by one author, but by many authors. We'll get to that a little later on. Uh, just keep in mind the existence of a second and third Enoch kind of plants the seed of doubt concerning the veracity or the sacredness of the first book of Enoch. So is the book of Enoch inspired? Now, why do we even ask that question? Because there are many who insist. I mean, they will call you the devil. They will call you a heretic if you don't believe the book of Enoch to be included in scripture. And the reason why they say it should be included is because of the following reasons. Number one, some second temple Jews uh, believe that first Enoch was a sacred text. So if the Jews believe it was sacred text, who are we who are not Israelite to say it's not sacred text? Number two, some important Christian writers, called church fathers, supported the first book of Enoch. And they said it should be included in scripture. Number three, it is claimed that the book of Jude quoted directly from the book of first Enoch. So because of these reasons, they assert we should include Enoch in the biblical canon. Now, before we go ahead and address these sub-questions or sub-topics, let us first ask, well, who is Enoch in the first place? And why should we listen to him if he does have something to say? And if he did write the book of Enoch? Well, let's go back to Genesis 5, 21 to 24. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And so this is the story of Enoch. Now, for many people, they probably are not too familiar with the story of Enoch, and we're not surprised because not much is written about him. What we do know about Enoch is the fact he lived during the days of the patriarchs, which was thousands of years ago, before Noah, before Abraham. In fact, he was the great grandfather of Noah. So that gives you an idea of how old he is. So he lived during the time of Adam, during the time of creation, the time of the patriarchs. And according to scriptures, when uh, the book of Genesis was giving the genealogy, there is no uh, end date. There's no death date for Enoch because God, Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. What does it mean that God took him? No, it doesn't say God took him in heaven, although that's probably the likely scenario. However, in Hebrews 11 verse 5 kind of adds to it, gives a commentary that is biblically that is Holy Spirit inspired about Enoch in Hebrews 11, 5. Take note, Hebrews is in the, the New Testament. And so the apostles were teaching us something that we need to know about Enoch. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. And so when he was taken away, he was probably hard pot over and was not found because God had taken him but before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And so in the Old Testament, we find no passage that Enoch taught something. 
although perhaps he did, and it was not written about, because not everything that the patriarchs did is recorded in the Holy Scripture. So there are many events, many sayings that may be true, but was not recorded in Scripture. Enoch, according to what we know, because it's been written, he was taken away to where we don't really know. But he was taken away. What we do know is that he did not see death. And so Enoch was unique in that sense because he, according to Scripture, did not die. But if you read further in Hebrews, it does mention all of these died. Um, so we don't know for sure if that includes Enoch. So Enoch was a patriarch. And so according to tradition, according to the book of Enoch, he goes to heaven and he comes back to earth because in heaven he was given all of these mysteries about God, mysteries that mankind should know. And this would be helpful for human beings on earth so that they can survive the end times. And so he had to come back. And so when he came back, he produced a book and it's called the book of First Enoch. So what is the book of First Enoch all about? Well, it's divided into five major sections. You might even say there's one other section in verse six. I mean, number six, uh, for, uh, chapter 108. But it, for the most part, it's five different sections of the book of Enoch. The book of Watchers, the book of Similitudes, uh, the book of the Luminaries, the book of the Dean Visions. Book of the episode of Enoch. So, what is the book of Watchers all about? The book of Watchers, in this, which is encompassed in First Enoch 1 all the way to 36. And this section is about, it was written according to scholars who think around 3rd century BCE or BC and offers a detailed interpretation of Genesis chapter 6. Because when you read the Genesis account, of chapter 6, about the sons of God, about the Nephilim, about the daughters of men, uh, not much was written about it. So the book of Watchers is an elaboration of what took place, the details of what took place in Genesis chapter 6. So it narrates the revolt of the angels referred to as Watchers, resulting in God's decision to send the flood as described in Genesis 6. In this account, these rebellious angels are enamored by earthly women, marry them, and produce offspring who grow into giants. These fallen angels then instruct humanity in magic, weapon making, jewelry crafting, leading to increased violence and decadence among Earth's inhabitants. So, when you read the account from the Book of Watchers, there are some similarities to the Book of Genesis chapter six, which should not surprise us because after all, after all. The purpose of this section of um, Enoch is to elaborate on what happened to in Genesis 6, 1 to 4, and they added new things to it. This is why there are some, uh, some stuff that is similar and other stuff that's not similar, like teaching humanity magic or weaponry or ju uh, jewelry crafting, which led to violence and decadence among Earth's inhabitants. So that's the book of Watchers. Then there's the book of Similitudes. Or the book of parables in first Enoch 37 to 71. This section is thought to have been crafted in the first century BCE, uh, comprising three parables attributed to Enoch. The initial parables reveals that Enoch had any mysteries, including the celestial origins of Earth's weather patterns. In the subsequent parable, Enoch witnesses as a chosen one, ascending a glory filled throne to judge those who have turned away from God. This chosen one is then foreseen to reside on earth among uh, the virtuous. And according to chapter 46, Enoch identifies a figure known as the Son of Man. The book of parables elaborates on how the Son of Man, a chosen one, will eradicate sinners, dethrone monarchs, and neglect the one God. This figure was predestined for the creation of the world and is envisioned as a beacon for all nations. He is destined to be vener venerated by everyone on earth. And through his name, salvation will come to the upright. And so here, in the book of parables, uh, Enoch is speaking about a chosen one, a son of man. What comes to mind when you think of the son of man? Of course, Yahushua, because he is, in fact, the one chosen 
to bring uh, much uh, peace on earth by dethroning the monarchs, the kingdoms, so that his kingdom can be set up. And so we can see in Enoch 37 and 71, a lot of material that is kind of the same in the book of Daniel. And so I believe he's taking from the book of Daniel and he's talking about the Son of Man, okay? So that's the second part or the second chapter of the book of parables. And we have the book of luminaries, uh, first Enoch 72, 82, this section of the book of Enoch, likely the earliest among the Enochic writings. You notice um, this section is the earliest. And so the sequence that you have that I showed you earlier does not follow the sequence of when it was made. Okay, so somebody later on compiled it into one book. That's because the different sections were actually booklets. So five different booklets compiled into one book, and they call it the book of first Enoch. So this section is likely the earliest among the Enochic writings. It's thought to have originated in the third century BCE. It chronicles Enoch's voyage across the heavens led by the angel Uriel. The primary emphasis of this section is the detailed explanation of the astronomical principles on the the solar calendar. This calendar revealed by the specific community of the created and interpreted of Enoch consists of 364 days. Each month has 30 days with an additional day added in the first six, nine, and 12 months. This is where the people from Qumran, because the, the, uh, the religious sect or the Jewish sect who resided in this place called Qumran, by the way, the Qumran community is responsible for preserving what we now call the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so that community had their own calendar, which is different from the calendar that was upheld by mainstream Judaism. And so their calendar was consisted of a lunar, uh, of a solar calendar. Each month has 30 days with an additional day added in the third, sixth, ninth, and twelfth months. So this is from the book, uh, based on the book of Luminaries. Then we have the fourth book, the book of dream visions. This section of the book of Enoch is thought to have been written in the second century BC. You see how the chronology of how and when it was made is different from how it is sequenced when it's compiled. Here, Enoch shares with his son Methuselah two prophetic dreams about forthcoming events. The initial dream depicts the destruction of the world through Noah's flood. The subsequent dream is a symbolic narrative detailing human history from Adam to the eventual judgment, often referred to as the animal apocalypse. Within this allegory, humans are symbolized as animals, fallen angels as descending stars, and the archangels take the form of humans. The dream culminates in the final judgment followed by God introducing into this whole world. And so in the, in the book of the dream visions, he speaks to Methuselah. And there is this presentation of a dream that has symbolic meaning, which points to a new world to come after a judge. What I want you to notice here, though, is that this is a conversation between Enoch and Methuselah. So apparently Enoch went to heaven and went back right away to earth after these, these uh, mysteries of the new him because he still gets a chance to talk to Methuselah, because we know Methuselah eventually dies. And so his trip to heaven must not have been that long. So he goes back to earth and has a conversation with Methuselah. So the book of Enoch is presenting to us the idea that whoever wrote the book of Enoch, um, it was written during the days of the times of the patriarch. And so according to those who insist the book of Enoch should be added to the canon, they believe the Enoch is the actual writer, and that it was written long before the book of Moses. The, the Torah was written, it was written before the Torah. And so that's what they're asserting. It's one of the first books ever, it should be the first book that was actually ever written because he wrote it during the time when he had his conversation with Methuselah, which is kind of strange. I mean, you're going to make this argument that the book of Enoch is the oldest book because it was written by Enoch. And so you have to kind of test that idea. So I want to point that out and put it out there because we'll look at it later on and in also our additional studies. 
And then lastly, there is the book of the Epistle of Enoch, this section is thought to have been crafted, put together, compiled in the second century BCE. It features Enoch or the sons of righteousness amidst a corrupt era. He proceeds to enumerate a series of admonitions against the wicked for their oppression of the virtues. The section wraps up by alluding to Enoch's writings, which will be presented to the righteous in the final days. The section also describes the extraordinary birth of Noah. Upon his birth, it's recounted that Noah's face and hair radiated as an, a white glow. He astonishing, astonishingly stands up. He rises from the midwife's hands where he was just born, and he stands up right, and extols or praises uh, Yahuwah, such an uh, event alarms Noah's father, I would be too, if the baby was just born, all of a sudden stands up and starts talking, <laughs> right? So such an event alarms Noah's father, Lamech, leading him to speculate that Noah might be offspring, offspring of a fallen angel. Seeking clarity, Lamech implores his father, Methuselah, to consult Enoch. Enoch clarifies to Methuselah that Noah is genuinely the next progeny. The unique radiance is attributed to Noah's exceptional holiness, indicating his mission to safeguard humanity. So here in the last section of the Book of Enoch, we have some admonitions about leading a, a, a righteous way of life. Apparently during this time, there was a lot of oppression, a lot of corruption, a lot of violence, and the people of God should be different. So that was the message of this last section. And to kind of to, pay, to highlight the need for righteousness, he points them to Noah, who was unique because of his super holy stature. He was glowing white even at the time of his birth. And so, when you look at the five sections of the book of Enoch, and in my estimation, in my opinion, I will begin by making this following statement, which might be controversial. You might be, you might say, tell me, oh, you're going to go to hell, but it doesn't. Well, this is what I believe. The book of First Enoch is not, okay, N-O-T, is not inspired. This is what I believe, and this is what I will attempt to prove uh, in the Bible study today. So why is First Enoch not inspired? First of all, Enoch did not write First Enoch. And because if the book of Enoch, for, when I say book of Enoch, I'm referring to first Enoch, okay? Not second Enoch, not third Enoch. So the book of Enoch is actually presenting itself to have been written by Enoch himself. It says Enoch 1, 1 to 3. So the words of the blessing of Enoch. And so he's telling how he heard and how he understood. And then he speaks about the elect of his writing for the purpose of helping the elect to obtain salvation. And so he is the one who is presented as the writer of the book. So the book of Enoch claims that Enoch himself is the author of the book. And so that's why it's called Book of First Enoch. However, when we look at the um, details of the book of Enoch, when we examine the structure, the grammar, the syntax, the topics, the doctrine, the, the doctrines that are presented, it tells us that this was probably not written by Enoch, because for this to be written by Enoch, then the book of Enoch should be dated all the way back to when? The time of the patriarchs, right? If it's legitimately the true book of Enoch. And so there are several, four reasons I'm going to give you why I believe that this was not written by Enoch, that it was somebody else. In fact, I believe. It's a compilation of writers. It's actually a set, a group of people living in the Qumran community who put together booklets, different topics, and then compiled it to make it look like one book. Okay, so why do I believe Enoch was not the writer? First of all, reason number one, first Enoch contains source material from the books of Isaiah, Zechariah, Ezekiel, and other Old Testament scripture. So they take it from Isaiah, Zechariah, Ezekiel. And so this suggests that Enoch, first Enoch, was written after the captivity, during that period of time, uh, which we call the intratestamental period, the 400 silent years 
of scripture. It was written at that time. Now, one might say, but brother, what if it's the other way around? What if Isaiah, Zechariah, and Ezekiel took content from First Enoch, right? Instead of uh, First Enoch taking content from Isaiah, Zechariah, and Ezekiel, it was the other way around. That is what some people are going to try to convince you to believe that Isaiah took content from First Enoch, Ezekiel took content from First Enoch, instead of First Enoch taking content from Isaiah, Zechariah. And Ezekiel. However, I believe it was First Enoch who took uh, some of the phrases, the words from the other biblical books. And the reason I believe that is reason number two. The oldest fragments of First Enoch that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls were in Aramaic. There are no Hebrew manuscripts of First Enoch, and this was important to the Hebrew people. For a manuscript, for a book to be considered even sacred, not inspired, but sacred, it had to have a Hebrew testimony. If it was not written in Hebrew, they don't believe it is inspired. And so there is no, I mean, the Aramaic um, pieces of fragment was really very a few in number, but the majority of it's on Ethiopic, Ethiopic. It's not Greek, it's not uh, Hebrew, but Ethiopic. And so, so when you consider the fact that the book of First Enoch, the oldest of the manuscripts that you can find sparse fragments made in, uh, that was in Aramaic, but in contrast to that, we have the big Isaiah scroll finding. And when they dug up um, the Dead Sea and they come up, they were able to discover all of these scrolls, there was a, a big a uh, big, big fragment, uh, many, many scrolls that contain the chapters of the book of Isaiah. This is from Israel Museum. It's called the Great Isaiah Scroll, according to this museum. The Great Isaiah Scroll is one of the original seven Dead Sea Scrolls discovered in Qumran in 1947. It is the largest and best preserved of all the biblical scrolls and the only one that is almost complete. The 54 columns contain all of them all 66 chapters of the Hebrew version. This is the ancient Hebrew word, not Aramaic, but Hebrew of the biblical book of Isaiah, dating from 125 BCE. It is also one of, one of the oldest of the Dead Sea Scrolls, some 1,000 years older than the oldest manuscripts of the Hebrew Bible known to us before the scrolls discovery. So we know that the book of Isaiah is found almost in complete form written in Hebrew. And on the other hand, the most complete form of Enoch is only found in Ethiopic, in Ethiopic from Ethiopia, who regard the book of uh, Enoch to be uh, inspired. And this is, the dating for that is the 15th century AD. So when you look at the clues, Isaiah, backed up by Hebrew scriptures, by Hebrew fragments that contain practically all of it, all of the content of Isaiah, and compare that with Enoch, the most complete form is found in Ethiopic in the 15th century AD. What will you say, what will you conclude logically is the one that came first? Of course, it's the book of Isaiah. This is why the other existing Old Testament books where we find Hebrew fragments for they came before the book of First Enoch. That being said, the book of First Enoch, they copy or they use the sources of these other uh, Old Testament books for their source material. Make sense? Okay, so there's reason number three. Examining the grammar, the syntax, and the doctrinal content of First Enoch in the light of historical data reveal it was written in Hellenistic times. And so if you are a scholar, or if you're a regular person, you're reading a document, you look at the details of the document, you look at the grammar. Does this grammar correspond to the grammar used at which time? Because if you look at the grammar and you look at the syntax, you look at the vocabulary today, very different from the time in the 18th century. This is why if you read a, a, a report from the 18th century and you compare it today, you know there's a big difference. And so a linguist 
or a scholar, or someone who studies ancient artifacts, when they read ancient books, they know, okay, this follows the pattern that was found at this time. And so scholars, when they read the book of Enoch, it reveals to us certain things. Because when you look at its grammar, its syntax, the content, it tells us when it was written. You can even do that today, right? For example, if you find material written and you read about it and it speaks about people going to the Twin Towers in New York City, what do you conclude? Oh, this was written before 2000. When was the bombing? 2001, right? Not after. So you have those clues. And when scholars look at the book of Enoch and look at these clues that normal readers might not find, they conclude it was written in the Hellenistic times, which means it took place when Greece was in power over part of Israel, over all Israel in that area. And so this was the intratestinal period. This is why the book of First Enoch was likely written in that time frame, according to scholars. Uh, in this book, Jewish literature between the Bible and the Mishnah, Enochic use of pagan mythological motifs and its preachments against Gentile oppression are clear marks of the text setting in the Hellenistic world and its complex interaction with the events and culture of that world. And so it's quite evident when you look at the content of Enoch, it reveals the political climate the cultural climate, and also the religious climate of that time. And it matches perfectly during the Hellenistic world. Hence, it was written not before Isaiah, not before Moses. It was written long after these books were already completed. And so that's reason number three. So reason number four. The consensus among scholars is that first Enoch was not a book authored by one person, but it's actually a compilation of booklets written by different authors across a long period of time. In other words, the book of Enoch was not written by one author at one point in time. It was written over a span of hundreds of years. This is why you have those different booklets that I showed you, right? And according to some of those who uh, deeply do the research concerning the book of Enoch, like Dr. Peter Gentry, who wrote numerous articles on the book of Enoch, and Al Andrew Fountain, this is what they have to say. More recently, major scholars in the field, such as Warren T. Uh, Stuckenbrock, so that's me, Stuckenbrock, place the writing down of the earliest sections of First Enoch in the third century BC during the intratestinal period, the Hellenistic times. An important point as stated by Stuckenbrock, uh, Stuckenbrock, Stuckenbrock, is that each of these groups of compositions circulated in a form that differed variously from the text forms in which we would eventually be received in the Ethiopic tradition. What we think then in terms of a growing collection of Enochic varieties, freestanding works not initially collected together were eventually combined, compiled according to a process not at all clear at the present time. So according to many scholars, when they look at the book of Enoch, they know, it's disjointed. It's not, it's not, it was not created as one book, but many different books combined together. And so there was a growing collection of Enoch writing. This is what even after first Enoch, there's second Enoch, there's third Enoch. This tells us it was a product, not of one person, but a compilation of the works of many people. And these people are advocating for certain political stance, certain religious beliefs, and the Galatia community found in Qumran. Okay, so it's a collection of books written over a span, not of, uh, of hundreds of years. And so I want to look at the different sections of the book of Enoch, the watchers, scholars uh, identify different dates for each of these sections. For example, the book of watchers, third century BC, book of similitudes, the book of parables, first century BC, the book of uh, Illuminaries, 3rd century BC, a book of dream vision, 2nd century BC, book of episodes, Enoch, 2nd century BC. So this rules out the possibility that Enoch was the one who wrote the book of Enoch. It's impossible that he was the one who wrote the book of Enoch because of the reasons 
I have mentioned thus far. Additionally, according to other scholars, uh, First Enoch is a collection of apocalyptic revelatory texts that were composed between the late or a century BC and the turn of the era, the size of the collection, the diversity of its contents, and its many implications for the study of ancient Judaism and Christian origins make it arguably the most important Jewish writing that has survived from the Greco Roman period. And so, according to the scholars, Enoch the first is a collection, not just one book, but a collection written by many different people. And it's important because it reveals politics, religion, during that time that informs us about the development of Jew, Jew, uh, Judaism and how it eventually impacted the Christian world. This is why it's an important book. We're not saying that the Enoch is not important. It's important in the sense it reveals much about the culture of its day because a lot of it reflects what was happening and the concerns of certain sects and they express their concerns and objections against maybe the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the form of these books. And so it is important in that sense. It doesn't mean, however, it is a, uh, it's, uh, inspired or God breathing. This is why the, the books such as First Enoch, Second Enoch, Third Enoch, and other uh, many other books, because First Enoch. Is that the only book that was written during the intra testament period? There were many books written during that time, and many of these books are called Apocrypha, right? Have you heard of that? Apocrypha, the book of Apocrypha. So many other extra books that's not in the canon, and also the book of Enoch. This is called Pseudo Epigrapha. So there's apocryphal books, and among the apocryphal books, you can you have the Pseudo Epigrapha. The word Pseudo Epigrapha means pseudo, false. Epigrapha implying the authorship is falsely ascribed. In other words, whoever wrote the book of Enoch, or the group of people who wrote the book of Enoch, uh, they wrote that book not to imply, or not to say that it was authored by one person, Enoch, but to use Enoch as a source of inspiration to express their concerns. And so they call it the book of Enoch, right? So in other words, the stated author is not the genuine writer. The actual writer of this text credited the work to a historical figure, specifically the patriarch Enoch. Such pseudo epigraphal writings were prevalent between 200 BC and 200 AD. And so it was during that period of time, 200 BC, 200 AD, when there was a, like an avalanche of all these pseudo-epigraphic work, which means it is a work that attaches a name, makes it appear that he's the author, but in fact, he was not the genuine author of the work. Okay, so this is why I believe Enoch was not the author of the book of first Enoch. Now, let's go to uh, the things that we presented earlier. Why do some insist? That first Enoch should be in the Bible. And of course, their first argument was well, there are some temple uh, Jews, second, second temple Jews. When we say second temple Jews, this was after the captivity. First temple was during the reign of Solomon, right? And David. That was first temple. Captivity happened. Uh, they built another temple. So this is the second temple. So there's this, there's a the second temple Jews uh, believed. According to those who insist that Enoch should be in the Bible, they say that first Enoch is sacred text because there are some sects of Judaism who believe that Enoch is sacred text. Um, now, it mentions some, which is true, but most, because there are many Jewish sects, they're, they're disjointed. They were not united, different uh, sects of Judaism after the captivity. Okay, and so most Jewish texts actually reject first Enoch. This is why when you go to mainstream Judaism and ask for the canon of Hebrew scriptures, Enoch is not included. Okay, so the only ones who consider first Enoch sacred were those in Qumran. Now, who are the Jewish sects in Qumran? Some say the Essenes, 
Some say it's not the Essenes. It doesn't really matter. We know they came from Qumran. Okay, so these Jewish sects, these people who come from Qumran, they're the ones who created Enoch, and naturally they're the ones who's going to endorse Enoch. Right? They created it, and so they're going to endorse it. Or if those who believe Enoch was the or, or was an actual was a book written by Enoch himself, well, Qumran, the community Qumran would be the ones to promote and endorse the book of Enoch. Now, when the Qumran community says that the first Enoch is sacred, they actually mean something other than making it seem that it was inspired. What do you mean? We all know that most Jewish sects reject first Enoch, but the Qumran community, they accept it. However, there are limitations for their acceptance of the book of Enoch. According to the Dead Sea Scrolls today, well, James Vanderkam, even scholars who defend the claim that Enoch was considered scripture, nevertheless, must concede that the Qumran literature does not seem to name the work that we know as first Enoch as an inspired or revealed source. So even the community there in Qumran, when you look at the writings, because they have many writings, for example, we have lots of literature and so many books, not just the book of Enoch. We'll be overwhelmed by the number of books that they collected. But when they collected these books in the community, they had a, a categorization procedure. There are some books categorized as script as a scripture or revealed source and categorized as not scripture. They, they had a category system. When you look at the writings there in Qumran, and so according to scholars, when you look at all the different writings in Qumran, there is no um, indication whatsoever that the Qumran community asserts first Enoch as inspired. It's important, but to them it's not inspired. There's a big difference because we have many books today that are important. You know, we have many commentaries today that are important, right? But it's not inspired. And so if you have a book, for example, you buy, you buy a Bible commentary, which I do suggest, by the way, because it helps us to understand the Bible. The Bible commentary is not the Bible itself. Can the Bible commentary make errors? Yeah. Can the Bible be erroneous? No. Because the Bible is inspired, the Bible commentary is not. You see the difference? And so according to the community in Quran, when they consider the book of Enoch, they don't, con they don't consider it as scripture. Why do we know this? Let's dig deeper in the Old Testament canon of the New Testament church, Robert T. Becker, a uh, professor and scholar, who the Qumran literature, like other Jewish literature, good, quotes the canonical scriptures with great frequency and uses conventional formulas for the purpose. It only rarely quotes the Essi to the Epigrapha, never using such formulas for giving any other indication that the works quoted were of prophetic or canonical authority. You see, the Qumran community had a system in their system when they would quote or when they would use certain books, you will know if they considered canonical or it's not canonical. So when you examine the way they use their books, one thing for sure is that when they use the book of Mina, it was never used in a way with any indications that it was prophetic or canonical. And according to further research, it is now clear that the main purpose of some of the pseudo epigrapha, lately identified as Essie or proto Essie, so let's say it's Essie or proto Essie, it doesn't really matter who, but there's a group of people who live in the Quran uh, community, was to expound and maintain the Essene interpretation of the Pentateuch over against rival interpretations. You see, during that time, the Sadducees, the Essenes, there was the Pharisees and many other Jewish sects, and they all had the Pentateuch. They all believed the same canon of scripture, but they had different what? Interpretations. And so to defend their own interpretation of the Torah, the Pentateuch or the Tanakh, what they would do is to create other books. And what was the purpose of these other books? To interpret 
according to their belief what the Pentateuch actually says. This is particularly clear in the case of the uh, newly discovered Qumran Temple Scroll. But it also applies to the astronomical book in First Enoch, the Jubilees, and to an extensive section of the Aramaic Testament of Oliva. If this is true, it means that the Essenes and the other Qumran community were not really meaning to add to Old Testament prophecy any more than to Old Testament law, Torah. As regards to the Pentateuch, uh, what their pseudo, uh, pseudonymous legal writings offered was an interpretation. So the pseudo epigrapha was not meant to be used as canon, but as an interpretation of what canon says. A commentary, a revealed interpretation, certainly, but not more than an interpretation. As regards Old Testament prophecy, what their pseudonyms, uh, apoc pseudonymous apocalyptic writings offered, was again an interpretation of it supplemented perhaps, but only from natural sources like arithmetic and astrology, not from supernatural. This interpretation, too, was evidently held to be uh, a revealed interpretation, but an interpretation was all that it aimed to be. So when you go do some digging in the Quran community, you're going to find many, many scrolls, many, many writings, many, many books. And according to their system, the canon was already set. There was already a set of books that were identified as in Spanish. And so the pseudo epigrapha, which is called the uh, pseudonymous apocalyptic writings, they were not considered canon, but interpretations of canon. So even the Qumran community who held first Enoch in my regard never considered it as scripture or inspired, but simply an interpretation or commentary on canon, commentary on inspired scripture. So that's reason number one. So reason number two, the entire Jewish, I mean, that, that, no, this is reason number two, the entire Jewish community, including the Qumran sect, who produced and endorsed first Enoch in other books, never regarded it as scripture or inspired. They were used as sources of interpretation or commentary to defend their views. It's like today when uh, Christians fight about trib, is it mid-trib, pre-trib, post-trib, and so each camp will produce their own commentary and own books about the book about, about the end times, right? It's the same thing. Each camp will produce their own books of commentary about what's written in the Bible. It's the same thing happened during the, the days of uh, first century Judaism, or even and even before that. Okay, uh, let's go to another reason why we don't believe that uh, Marina is inspired. According to this book, the Old Testament Canon, the New Testament Church, by the Tibetan, page 365, mentions the use by the uh, Therapeute or the Essenes or of the standard three divisions of the canon. So during the time before, long before our king, long before the apostles, there was already a standard division of the canon. In other words, there was an unidentified canon already. There was an identified collection of books that are inspired. This was already well known during the time, hundreds of years before the time of Yahusha. And this grouping is has a threefold division. That's why it's called the standard three division of the canon. And one of the standard counts of the canonical books, so they have a threefold canon and also a count of how many books are included in the canon. This was identified even before the time of Yahusha. Implied that the three sections and the standard count were already agreed and settled among the Jews before the SME separated from the rest of 152 BC. And so you can kind of see why Qumran community decided to produce their own different books because they wanted to present their own ideas. Like people today, they believe in King Trib, they produce their own set of books. That during that time, there were these groups of Jews who did not believe in Sadducees or the Pharisees, and so they separated. They went to live in Quran in caves, and they developed their own books. And so this is what they did, right? Groupings of their own uh, pseudo-epigrapha in a separate appendix, implying 
that the three sections and the standard count were already agreed and settled on to Jews before the Essenes separated from the rest about 152 BC. Three of the books, of course, Enoch, had been written by that time. The Essenes had evidently not attempted to include them in any of the three sections of the canon, or to number them in the count of the canonical books, since it, they did nothing of the kind after the separation, either with the pseudo epigrapha or subsequent pseudo epigrapha. So, according to the research, when you look at the Qumran community, they understand there's already an identified list of books. It's a threefold division of the canon. And in this threefold division, you have a, a number, a set, a set number of how many books are included in that canon. And so when they when they organize or categorize these books, because they have a lot of books, not just the canon, they have the canon, which is in three sections, and then they will have as an appendix the other extra books, including pseudo epigrapha, which includes what book? The book of first not. So according to um, the research, according to the scholars, according to those who study the Quran community, the book of Enoch was not canon, but an appendix, so an extra source of interpretation for what is already canon. So there are three divisions of the canon. Do you know what they are? The three divisions of the canon? It's the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvi. The Torah is the law, five books. The Nevi'im, the prophets. The Ketuvim. The writings. So that's how Jews organize. That's why it's called Tanakh. Torah, Nevim, Ketuvim. Or Tanakh is in Hebrew, it's only three letters. Tanakh. Right? And so the Tanakh is identified by these three categories law, the prophets, the writings. That's the Old Testament um, canon. So there was already an Old Testament canon recognized by the Quran community, and they don't miss it. They understand it's sacred, set apart, different from what the, book, the books that they are producing. And even according to Josephus, a church historian who happens to be a, a Jew, right? He says, Our book, uh, those which are just to believe, are only 22. So during his time, the books that were identified, he says, at 22 and contain the record of all time of these five in the books of Moses. Thinking what they are. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, right? You know what they are, comprising the laws. Uh, this pure, and then from the death of Moses down to Artaxerxes, uh, the prophets, after Moses wrote the events of their own times in 13 books, from the 13 prophetic books. Uh, the remaining four books contain hymns to God and precepts for the conduct of life. So these include Psalms and Proverbs and the books of history. So these are called writings. Okay, so, and he goes on to say at the bottom, uh, for all those such long ages have not passed, no one has ventured to add or to remove or to alter anything. And it is an instinct with every Jew from the day of his birth to regard them as the decrees, the oracles of God, to abide by them and if you be cheerfully to die for them. And so for a long, long time, way before Josephus, up until the time of Josephus, there's already an identified set of Hebrew sacred canon. Three categories. It's called the Tanakh. And in the Tanakh, we have a total of 22 books. In our Bible today, we have 39. That's because we, we separate like first Samuel, second Samuel, right? We separate um, Lamentations from Jeremiah. And so we have all these distinctions that the original did not have. And so we know there was an Old Testament canon that was already determined during the time of Yahusha and the time of the apostles. So when they came into the scene, it was already a set of books considered inspired. However, time will come when the inspiration would cease, because when Moses was writing, the prophets were writing, Ezra was writing, time eventually came, and there's going to be normal writing, right? This was prophesied in Zechariah, Zechariah 13. And on that day, the day when there will be no more inspiration, 
declared to do all those, I will cut off the names of the idols in your land, so that they shall be shall be remembered no more. And also, I will remove from the land the prophets and their spirit of uncleanness. And if anyone again prophesies, his father and mother who bore him will say to him, You shall not live, for you speak lies in the name of Yahuwah. And his father and mother who bore him shall he, uh, pierce him who when he prophesies. On that day, every prophet will be ashamed of his vision. When he prophesies, they will not put on a hairy cloak in order to deceive. But he will say, I am no prophet. I am a worker of soil, for a man sold me in my youth. And if one asks, what are these wounds on your back? He will say, the wounds I received in the house of my friends. So back then, during the captivity, many false prophets appeared. So Yahushua, Yahuwah says, no more prophets. And so he takes away inspiration. This is why for the Malachi, the book of Malachi was the last one written that was considered inspired. So inspiration ceased after 420 BC, after Malachi finished his book. This is why really the, the, uh, the earliest book of the Hebrew scriptures is the book of Malachi, right? When, when I said, okay, not the earliest, but the, the last one to be written was the book of Malachi. And so from then, there were 400 plus silent years where there's no word from Yahuwah. We call this the ancient intertestamental period. Traditionally, it, considered, it is considered to cover roughly 400 years, spanning the ministry of Malachi, to the appearance of John the Baptist. So for the longest time, the people of Israel had no word of God. There was no inspiration or new information or new revelation. Revelation ceased after Malachi, right? Until John the Baptist came in the early first century. It is roughly continuous with the Second Temple period and encompasses the age of Hellenistic Judaism. And so the Second Temple period, uh, the Hellenistic period or Hellenistic Judaism and the Intratestament period, they are in sync. Okay. And so during this time, called the Intertestamental Period after 420 BC, guess what? There was no more inspired writings. But it doesn't mean there were no more writings. There are still writings that were produced, but they were not inspired. For example, during the Intertestamental Period, what are some of the books that came to be? Book of Maccabees. How many here have heard of Book of Maccabees? Book of Maccabees was a book written during the Intertestament period, after inspiration ceased. And so when this book was written, look at what the author says. And they took counsel concerning the author over an offering, which had been defiled, as to what they should do with it. And there fell to them the counsel to tear it down, so that it would not become a reproach to them because the nations defiled it. And they tore down the altar, and put away the stones on the mound of the house in a suitable place until a prophet would come to give an answer concerning these things. And so here, the writer of the book of Maccabees tells us that they were stuck. They didn't know, know what to do with the temple because it was the fire. And so good counsel, appealing to good counsel, what they did was to kind of put tear it down and hide it for the meantime until they get direction from a prophet. Because at that time, there was no prophet. There was no person who had direct revelation from God. This is by commenting on the book of Maccabees, according to Peter Gentry, Dr. Peter Gentry, this is a clear statement that according to uh, the sum in the Maccabean period, no one was speaking for God at this particular period of time in the history, the intra-testamental period. Not only does the first, Mac does first Maccabees not make any claim to divine inspiration, but the author specifically denies that the book is inspired by God by declaring that no one was speaking for God at this time. And so here we have an intra-testamental book called Maccabees. Is it a useful book? Yeah, because it's a book of history. Is it inspired? No. If it's not inspired, may it contain errors? Yes. Is it still useful? Yeah, because it tells us history. This is why it's a useful book, like Enoch is a useful book. However, it doesn't mean it is. So Maccabees is not inspired. And so if there was no prophet during the intra-testamental period, well, how would they make decisions? Right? I mean, 
Maybe I can rephrase that question. During our time today, do we have a living prophet? <laughs> Is there a living prophet today who receives direct revelation from God? No. That ceased after the Apostle John. After the Apostle John, there was no more. Um, we call that there's no more prophet who receives that record from God information. You don't have that anymore. If someone claims he does, you don't believe him. <laughs> right? If somebody claims to be a prophet, and like, don't believe him. He's lying. <laughs> it's not true. And so, how do we make decisions today? We base our decisions today by looking at what's already revealed. We don't look for new revelation, we look at what's already revealed. Isn't that what we do? Well, guess what? During the ancient testament period, when you look at the writings of the Qumran community, if there was no prophet during that time, how did they get their guidance from? It's not from the research. The rule of the community is a scroll, because when they looked at the different caves, they found different scrolls, and in those scrolls, they find different types of booklets. What is the rule of the community? This is how we are to be guided. Without the role of a prophet, the rule the rule of the community describes a leader, priest, Levites, and men of the assembly all rank for the authority of their statements within the community. Their rules for uh, the rules for the leader or master make him entirely reliant on what has been revealed. See that? And so the process of determining what to do for the sake of the community, they don't look for new revelation. They rely on existing. Revelation. There is no mention of anyone speaking directly, directly for God at this time. Decisions are made by the community. And according to 1 QS 911, it means the scroll that was found in Qumran K1. Okay, the rule is in effect until the coming of the prophet and the Messiah of Aaron in Israel. Negatively, the emergence. Ah, pseudo epigraphical literature is clear testimony for the cessation of inspiration. Since authors appeal to authoritative figures in order to claim divine inspiration. And so the whole body of pseudo epigrapha reveals and shows this. And so during the intratestamental period, no prophet. No word of God, no inspiration. And so what did the people do? They wrote books, but appealed to authority of the past. Just like who? Enoch. What do we call this? Pseudo-epigrapha. What does that mean? A book which uh, appeals to the authority of Enoch and makes it appear that he wrote the Book so that people will listen, so it will influence the thinking of the people. This is why during the intertestamental period, all of these pseudo epigrapha came into the scene. So many apocalypse of Abraham, apocalypse of Adam, testament of Adam, second Baruch, third Baruch, fourth Baruch, apocalypse of David. Look, first Enoch, second Enoch, third Enoch. And so all these books have the names of certain authority figures. So they appeal to their authority, even though they're already past. They're all that they, they no longer were in existence, they're no longer there. And so these books were given the category pseudo epigrapha. What is included? First Enoch, second Enoch, and third Enoch. So the book of Enoch is pseudo epigrapha and was developed during the ancient testament period. And there was no inspiration or direct revelation from Yahuwah in all of Israel. And therefore, was included in the Tanakh or the Old Testament scriptures. This is why it's not inspired, because it was written when there was no inspiration. Does it make sense? It's a product of literature appealing to authority of figures from the past so that they can make a case for what they believe the Pentateuch or the Old Testament canon is saying. It is not saying this is also canon. There's a big difference, uh, beloved brethren. So when Hebrew scriptures were translated into Greek, what is it called? Septuagint, which was often directly quoted by Yahushua and the apostles, the book of Enoch was not included. So, you know, when you read, for example, the book of, uh, our king Yahushua, the apostles, they would quote Old Testament, right? Old Testament. And so I want you to, to, to do this experiment. 
I want you to go to the NIV, for example. And whenever, for example, you have to share or the apostles would quote a Old Testament scripture, they would always say it's written. It is written in the Hebrew scripture. And when you compare what they say with the Hebrew scripture, it is different. It's the same in essence, but some of the words are different. You know why? Because Yahushua and the apostles were quoting not from the Hebrew source, but from the Septuagint. You see, the Septuagint was the Old Testament Bible of the apostles in our King Yahushua. There was a Bible already in the Old Testament. And so there was already a set of books during the time of our King Yahushua and the apostles that was considered sacred text of Hebrew literature. What is it called again? The Tanakh. And it had three divisions, Torah, the Deen, the Law, the Prophets, the writings. And there's no manuscript or historical evidence indicating that the book of Tanakh was ever accepted as part of this threefold canon scripture. Neither the Greek Septuagint nor the Hebrew Nazarene text include the book of Enoch in their sets. This is why we're not surprised there's no copy of the book of Enoch in Hebrew. But even if there is copy in Hebrew, it's still not found in the list of canonical literature considered by the Hebrew people as inspired. And so the Hebrew canon was already determined by Israel hundreds of years before, and also during the time of the Hushan, the apostles, it was there. And the apostles and Narkin Yahusha did not reject the canon. What Yahusha rejected was the traditions of men. But the Hebrew canon, he did not. That's because the people of Israel were the ones put in charge to compile and preserve what is canon. This is why we go to them. And even the Apostle Paul testified to this. Look at what Apostle Paul says. What advantage has the Yahudi? Or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way. Chiefly, most important. So he can say chiefly. Because to them were committed the oracles of God. In other words, what is considered canon was given or entrusted to the Hebrew people. They were the ones who compiled and preserved the Hebrew scriptures. This is why I believe we were supernaturally guided in preserving the Tanakh. Romans 9, Apostle Paul says, I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. That's because he used to be a Pharisee. Also, place to be a Pharisee. Now he's speaking about these Pharisees, about the, about the Sanhedrin, and he's saying this, right, about the Sanhedrin. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and come up from Christ for the sake of my brothers, those of my own race, the people of Israel. This is the adoption of the Son, the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving uh -huh, the law, the temple worship and promises. And so, Apostle Paul is telling us that the Hebrew people were given a test by Yahuwah. To oversee the oracles of God or to compile and preserve what belongs to the canon. It's called the Tanakh, right? So the Tanakh, Torah, Nabim, the Ketuvim. You know who also confirms and affirms the Tanakh? Guess who? Also Paul did. Who do you think also confirmed the Tanakh? These three different sections. Yahusha. Look at what Yahusha says. When he's talking about scriptures of the Old Testament. He identified the Tanakh. Take a look. Luke 24. Then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, and the prophets, and the Psalms, concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And so the Tanakh the threefold division of canon or scripture was identified and confirmed by our king. Yeah, not only that, because when the Jews had these three categories of scripture, they organized the books according to their different categories. And so they would organize the book. You know, when we have our Bible today, the Old Testament, it has Genesis, and then the last book of Malachi, right? And when you look at the Hebrew arrangement of the canon, it's different. 
the Hebrew original of the canon is not, it starts with Genesis, but it ends with Second Chronicles. It's different. And there's a reason why I'll show you. But even Yahusha confirmed the arrangement of the canon. Not only did he identify the three um, sections or the three categories of the canon, the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms, he also identified the bookends, the beginning and the last book of that arrangement of the canon. In the book of Matthew, 23, 25. And so upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zacharias, who we murdered between the temple and the altar. And so here, our king is speaking about chronology. When he mentions Abel, he is confirming the first book. What is that? Where is he found? Genesis. When he's speaking of Zechariah, he was confirming the last book, which is Second Chronicles, because the murder of Zechariah was recorded in Second Chronicles 24, 22, 21, which happens to be the last book of the arrangement of the canonical books made by the Hebrew people called the Tanakh. So here's the Tanakh, got the law, the prophets, the writings, the first book, a blood of Abel found in Genesis, blood of Zechariah found in Chronicles. And so our King Yahushua not only identifies the threefold division, he also tells us the bookends of this arrangement of canonical books, beginning with Genesis and ending with Second Chronicles. This is why Yahushua and the apostles confirmed the Tanakh that was compiled and preserved by Israel and did not include first Enoch. Did you notice that? There was no first Enoch. Was there a first Enoch here? None. There is no first Enoch. What we have here is what we have in our regular Bible today. So this was already standard. It was recognized by the people of Israel before Yahushua came, approved by Yahushua himself and by the apostles. This is why there's no Enoch. There's no Enoch in the Tanakh. Yahushua often quoted from the Tanakh. And when he does, he says, it is written. Not once did he quote the book of Enoch. Okay. And so in the three the Old Testament canon was already determined hundreds of years before and after, before and during the time of Yahushua and the apostles, and the candy did not include the book of Enoch. Now let's go to this next one. Some important Christian writers called the church fathers supporting first Enoch. You know, so they're appealing to the writings of the church fathers. And because of that, they say, oh, because the church fathers can do worse, the book of Enoch, we should include it in our. Canon. Well, first of all, who are the church fathers? I mean, are they reliable sources of what should belong to canon? No, because the church fathers, who were they? They were the people who taught and defended the scriptures after the death of the apostles, because the early church fathers are not authority of what is scripture and what is not. And they were fallible human beings. They were not apostles who wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. There was a big difference between the apostles and the so-called church fathers. Number two, the early church fathers did not agree on what they believed and often contradicted each other. And so why would we rely on the works of the early church fathers? And lastly, the early church fathers uh, came to the scene after the death of the apostles. And so when we look at the church fathers and what they wrote about, they often contradicted each other and they had different sets of beliefs. According to the website uh, Center of Apologetics and Research Ministry, I hope I got that right, CARN, uh, they, they compiled a list of all the different teachings of these so called fathers and then we have different sections. One is that they believe in the Papa for Scripture, yes or no. Baptism for salvation, communion, eternal security, Peter the Rock. So you have all these different lists of beliefs on these so-called church fathers. And you notice they don't all believe the same thing. Right? And so far, no one believes in your papa. Next one. Let me go to the first one. One of the earliest ones is Clement of Rome. They're at the bottom. He died 110. So he was like a contemporary of the apostle John. He didn't believe in the papa. Huh? Cyprian, Cyril, again, no one believes it. But you have these different beliefs, right? All the way to Theophilus of Antioch, Origin, 
And so you have all this conflicting information about what these fathers believed, what they thought, and the interpretation of people today who read the writings because they all, they all conflict each other, which is why we cannot use the church fathers as a source to teach or to base our belief if it should be hanging or not. And also, some of them believe wacky things. Uh, for example, Clement of Alexander believed the fallen angels would be saved. Gregory of Nisa believes Satan would be saved. Origen believes in universal salvation. Everyone would be saved. And so you cannot appeal to the writings of the church fathers because they all have different beliefs. Some, some of their beliefs are going out there. What do we believe in? The apostles. It's written already everything after the apostles, subject to error. Which is why after the appearance of these so called church fathers, what did we have? Wasn't there like a falling away from the faith and apostasy? You see, but nevertheless, when you do examine what the church fathers write, what they kind of all agree on, though, and this is really interesting. I don't know why they appeal to church father literature, because when you look at what they actually wrote, most church fathers did not believe that the book of Enoch was scripture. They believed it was important, but most did not believe. Those who say were like strong proponents of Enoch in scripture of Tertullian and origin. Come in here, remember Tertullian. Right? Tertullian, he wrote in the third century, called first Enoch scripture in his book on the apparel of women. But we need to understand that Tertullian fell in his later life to Montanism a heretical branch of Christianity. You see, Tertullian believed in these weird prophecies of the end times. So naturally, he would endorse, first of all, God, Enoch. And so he was, he was into these fantastic things, Tertullian. He likes to kind of kind of go over, you know, kind of think out of the box, kind of go over boundaries of scripture. This is why one of his works, Adversus Praxis Before He Died, Tertullian depicted the Trinity in the following way. Two beings are God, the Father and the Son, and with the addition of the Holy Spirit, even three, according to the principles of the divine economy number, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Ghost is God, and each is God. So it's from Tertullian that we have the, the doctrine of the Trinity, right? Back in the third century, not during the days of the apostles. And it was origin, they're saying origin preached all about uh Book of Enoch being inspired. He's also from the first century. He cites first Enoch, but the passages from Enoch that he cites do not appear in the version that we have. This tells us the version that we have, which is really based on the Ethiopic, is different from the version origin had. This tells us it underwent a lot of different changes because it was not inspired. Because if it was inspired, it would not go through a lot of changes. Make sense? So Origen mentions the book of Enoch, for example, in his work Contra Celsus, he doesn't quote it there, however, nor does he call it scripture. It would appear that he considered it a useful book, but there's no evidence that he thought it was scripture. So some of the church fathers did, did quote or use the book of Enoch. They never used it as an inspired book but it's a useful book of commentary. And so when we look at the book of Enoch and other extra biblical books, they're useful because they're informative. They inform history, politics, culture, religion. And this is vital to the understanding the context of the scripture. Because you want to know the times what the people were uh, dealing with. Okay, so number four, our last one for the day, the church fathers. Who mentioned first Enoch regarded it as an important and useful literary work, but was not regarded as inspired or God breathed. Okay, so in summary, why do we believe that first Enoch is not inspired scripture? Number one, Enoch did not write it, it's pseudo epigraph, which means it was written during the intertestinal times. And so when you look at the context and look at the content, we know it was not written. During the time of the patriarchs, when we look at the the extant literature, the extant evidence. We know it was not written before Isaiah from the Old Testament text. So we know Enoch did not write it. So pseudo epigrapha. It fits the the times when it was written. Okay. Number two, 
the entire Jewish community, including the Qumran sects, who produced and endorsed, they're the ones who produced it and, and, and endorsed it, they never regarded as scripture or inspired of the God, Enoch. They were used as sources of interpretation or commentary. Number three, the Old Testament canon was already determined hundreds of years before. And during the time of Kedusha and the apostles, and the canon did not include the Bukhav, Enoch. Lastly, the church fathers who mentioned for Enoch regarded as an important and useful leader everywhere, but was not regarded as inspired or God breathed. So there's four reasons why we don't believe in, that the book of Enoch is inspired scripture. But you know what? Even if we can erase all this. There's one reason why we should not believe the book of Enoch is inspired. You know what that is? The number one reason the book of Enoch is not inspired scripture is what we're going to talk about next week. Even if you can erase the first report, this one alone you need to listen to. This one alone you need to understand because this will tell us very strong, very powerful. But the book of Enoch is not scripture. And what we, what we talk about next week, we're going to address this claim. The Jew quoted from the book of first Enoch. Is that true? Why do we reject the book of Enoch as scripture? And so we're going to test that quote. We're going to test the book of Enoch because we haven't really gone into the details of Enoch. We're going to do that next week. We're going to shut. Concerning some of the things that we use. <laughs> and we're going to test it. Because the Bible says, test everything, hold on to the good, avoid every kind of evil. Because there are some comments and doctrines in the Bible that is heretical. And so the Bible says, test it. There's something good, good. Something evil, avoid it. Right? And so we're going, we want you to, to be present when we present this next week, brother, because it's important. Because if you want to read the book of Enoch, make sure that you don't believe the harmful doctrines presents, because it might affect your faith. Okay, I would be remiss in my duty I failed to tell you that. Yes, it may be helpful if you inform it, but be careful, test it, and we want to show you some of the heretical teachings found in the book of Enoch that we need to be careful for. So test everything, hold on to what is good, but avoid every kind of. Yeah. Okay, that is our lesson. Let's go ahead and stand for our spring. Almighty and merciful Father, Yahuwah Abba, thank you for your guidance. Thank you for your inspiration. We believe, Father, that you continue to bless your people. You want us to learn more about you, but teach us to discern through the power of your spirit that we may know the difference between true teaching and teachings that may lead us astray. Bless us, Father, in our study, when we test for all things, reveal to us what is good, and also please reveal to us what is good. Mm -hmm. Our King Yahushua, may you please strengthen our faith, bless us with more wisdom, be with us in all of our undertakings, and may you strengthen our hearts and souls, that we may be committed to you, follow your voice, that we might find life everlasting for you. Father, we believe that you have listened to our prayers. We ask everything in the name of our Lord and Savior, Yahusha HaMashiach. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters, I thank you for attending our Bible study for tonight. Before we go ahead and part ways, just a few reminders. This is all this coming weekend. We have our children's ministry, August 11 and August 12, and the week after, we're going to have our sacred names, Philippines. This will be done in Philippines or Tagalog. Um, this will be in our time, U.S. time, California time. 10 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on August 19th. So the Philippines will be August 20 at 1 o'clock p.m. We hope that you will support uh, this Bible study for that appointed time. That is all. And may Yahuwah Abba and Yahusha Hamashiach bless all of us.